まもなく、まもなく、振り出しポットが参ります。ご注意。Okay, so Cyberpunk 27. So it recently、um, got pushed back again amidst,、um, shall we say, controversy. Yes, amidst a lot of controversy. And I think a lot of it comes from the fact that it's a publicly traded company. And so,、yeah. like, they have to unveil their secrets because it's a public company. So it can't be a secret.、Nope. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, so I just, I don't know. I don't, maybe because I'm. Well, maybe this was just Schadenfreude, but I, I was reading the,、um, the Steam like, review. So when the, inf- when the news was posted, I, I don't know, I occasionally do this where I'll, I'll look at Steam comments, and there were all these comments about, like, oh, refunded, refunded, refunded. What am I going to spend my money on now? I'm going to spend it on this. No, I'm going to spend it on this. And it was just a lot of, like, real, like a lot of children, essentially. Yeah. And that's really harsh because I mean, it's not the developer's call, honestly.、No. At the end of the day, game developers don't have any say in when a game is launched or shipped. And trust me, there are a lot of developers that wish they could have delayed like even further,、yeah. right? But they are just told you have to ship it, you have to get it out the door now. It doesn't matter how many bugs there are still remaining, right? You just, it、yeah. is going to get out the door that day. And with the rise of day one patches, As a developer, like going gold is, is almost a joke because then you'll just day one patch things. Yeah. And it's not like, I don't know, it's a weird fence to, if there was a fence or a divide, it's a weird divide to even have because we are just in an internet world. Yeah. Well, it's also weird because, like, in many ways, then the, the release becomes sort of like a second beta. Because the thing is, like, when you have, I mean, Betas are always so limited in terms of like who they can invite and like, you know, what people are allowed to do that、mm-hmm. you're just not going to discover everything. Yes. I mean, QA can't discover everything. Like, beta tests can't discover everything. So it's inevitable, especially in like in the environment in which games are now produced. Cause, you know, the, the shipping gold standard came from the fact that you used to actually have to like print physical media and send、yes. them out. And that they were, ne- they were never going to be patched. Like, there is no patch for Duck Hunt. <laughs> yes, not, there is no patch for Duck Hunt. <laughs> Duck, Duck Hunt has a lot of bugs. It has a lot of really terrible, very <laughs> like, exploitable bugs, but they're never going to be patched because it's, you know, it exists on physical so media. So, Going Gold still, though, exists in terms of do you pass your certification or do、yeah. you pass, right? And it is your, say, physical, shippable on disc copy, in that it's like, are all your assets to quality? Um, right, the big one is that Sony, say for example, PlayStation has to have everything in powers of two. Like, that's just any, any developer, you'll Google that, you'll see it. And like, like for indies and everything. Yeah. And that just means that you can, you can put a texture that's not of power of two, but either it won't render correctly or something will like right, mess up. It could lead to memory corruption depending on where it's used and how it's used. And so, right, Sony certification is every texture needs to be a power of two. And they'll scrub through it automatically now after you've gone gold and you could fail cert if you don't have that.、Yeah. So, it is very possible that a game, right, goes gold. In air scarecrows and、yeah. uh, is all good to go on disc, but then the rest of the gameplay or actual functionality is in the day one patch. Yeah. Right? Because they just need to pass the bare minimum certification requirements. Yeah. So I can definitely see something happening. Like, I think this happens throughout the industry now. I don't think it's just a. Like a cyberpunk 2077 problem. No, absolutely not. And、yeah. the thing is, like, all of the sort of the, the salacious details about like the absurd crunch and all of that, like, the, the, the problem is, is that, like, the, whenever I see one of those articles, it really frustrates me because it's always framed as if, like, oh, look what's happening at this particular company or look what's happening at this particular company. But the thing is, everybody does that. 
yes, everybody does that. It's, and it's, if you're a private company, you don't, you don't have to say, not a, yeah. you don't have to say yeah. anything. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, hey, guys, we have mandatory uh, 12 to 13 hour days on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Don't worry, we'll feed you your three meals those days. Um, but you must come in. And if you don't get things in, then you'll have a mandatory eight hour day on Saturday. But private company. So that never gets aired. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's the thing is that, I mean, OK, so let me put on my Marxist hat for a second. It's like at the end of the day, this is all just like ordinary capitalist exploitation. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this because I, I don't know, I was listening to some podcast and it was with a couple of guys who are in the, the writer's guild and they were talking about, they were bagging on Aaron Sorkin for reasons that, well, I mean, I don't like Aaron Sorkin either, but I but couldn't for remember. reasons that you weren't, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember why they were bagging on Aaron Sorkin, but at, at one point they brought up the, the writer's strike from a couple of years ago, because that's apparently when the two of them met. Right. And one of the things that they said is that, like, it's so ridiculous for someone in a position like Aaron Sorkin to be like, oh, well, you know, you don't need you don't need a union because, you know, minimums are stupid. And like, if you were just good enough, like you would make the money that you need, you should be making. And if you're bad, you'll automatically get like, you know, pushed out. But the point that they tried to make is that, like, but if we didn't have a union, you know, we would be working 20 hour days. We would be like, there would be all sorts of crap. Like directors try to pull crap all the time. And the only thing that prevents them is the Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild and, you know, labor laws. Those are the only things that actually prevent them from doing all that stuff. And so then you compare that to with what you see in the, like in the video game industry where they don't have a, it's like they don't have unions by and large. And you see exactly what happens. Like a culture has crept up over time where it's just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And so then when you see that salacious article about like, oh, one developer had worked, you know, like a hundred hour a week, you know, in the, in the last week before, it sh before a game shipped. Well, yeah, but at the same time, that also completely ignores the fact that across the board, people are generally working 60 hours a week or 50 yes. hours a week, Yep. which is way over. Like when you look at just, say like anthropological studies of productivity, what people should be working is basically between 30 and 35 hours a week. Yeah, Because after absolutely. that point, your productivity just plummets. It doesn't slowly go down. It's like literally you hit that 35, you hit that 35th hour in a week. And it's just like, you might as well not be doing anything. No, and honestly, that's where a lot of like games get broken or buggy or yeah. like they end up making really silly mistakes like a texture is not rendered in a power of two. That's actually a very, very easy and simple thing to do. Yeah. So if you fail that on cert, right, you're going, oh, I can't believe I typed a nine because at hour 68, you're just you're done. Yeah, you're like twice you the amount of 30 because hours. You literally can't see straight. So uh, yeah, so, so, exactly. So, so I'm dyslexic, so I can I can speak to how this actually works because what happens to me normally is something that happens to people when they become stressed or when they're tired. Like literally, there are things in your visual field that you stop seeing. You, yep. You just don't physiologically see them, and so you're going to make mistakes simply because like nothing got from your eyeball to your brain. Yeah. No, so there's this, so there's, so that's, I really want to like go further into like how the fact that you actually don't see things as well from like, yeah. uh, an, um, like an optometrist perspective, because it's very, very huge where well, stress no. completely like degrades your vision over time as well. I mean, I have bad, I have bad eyes, eyesight, but that's yeah. not related to my No, dyslexia. I have, it's no, absolutely. Dyslexia, bad eyesight, they are not the same thing as well as like stress induced blindness yeah. is also right. Not the same thing. Um, but like, it's very important for us, like in the game industry to look at like what film and um, like the film unions and like, I think film and television and those types of creative agencies, how they're running their yeah. studios. Because honestly, a lot of what happens in the games industry is I feel like sometimes it just learns from business practices from like waterfall or from like factory settings where it's like you yeah. are going to be the first in line because your art once art pops something out the level team gets it and then they put the art in there and it like yeah. doesn't allow for any creativity where the level teams are then going but wait the art doesn't fit like to a high level right production like factory line work it doesn't it's like no no, no the art has to fit no no yeah. this is a game it doesn't have to fit anything this is creative and well, so I think there's that battle at odds where it becomes because it's creative and you're constantly going back in waterfall, like going back in the pipeline, yeah. then suddenly the production 
right? Or if it's production driven or like whatever, whoever's on top is now looking at it like, oh, something's wrong in the pipeline. And no, it's just it, the pipeline for a lot of video game development studios doesn't allow for cross team collaboration yeah. or actual agile movement because it still thinks of things as art in levels in like yeah. programming in. And I think it's because a lot of like the games industry is still relatively new. It is still very much like you have to have a script and then you film the script, not thinking about, well, then you still change it like on the day to day. Well, you, you do, but at the same time, like, okay, so actually the, the film industry is probably not the best analogy. It's a close analogy, but the better analogy is actually to animation. Because, okay. the, because of the way animation works and the way animation has to be done, like animation is modular in the same way that like, vid, sorry, animation production is modular in the same way that video game production is. You often have to have like, you literally often have people on like completely different sides of the world, like doing just like one keyframe to another keyframe, and then they have to put it all together. But the way they're able to put that all together is precisely because like there is an entire, I guess you could say, it's the director and the producer's job to make sure that all of that is coordinated and all of that fits into like a specific vision. It's not just, and also it's weird because when you're talking about animation, there are like several different versions of an animated film or short that, mm -hmm. that get done. So you have, what is it? So, you know, you have storyboarding and then after storyboarding, you have what is essentially like a keyframe to keyframe mock-up of it. Then after that, you have a rough, what is called a rough, which is basically like making everything between the keyframes kind of make sense in like a pencil sketch sense. Um, and then that thing, that third thing, that third like complete version gets sent out to those individual people who then do like the finished work between those keyframes. And then when that comes back, because they've had that rough, they can yeah. fit it back in and they can see how all of the pieces are going together. And if any one of them doesn't work, they can literally just pull it out and have it redone. But the thing is you need to have that like strict control over like, it's really about vision. It's like having someone who's it's not just someone, it's actually several someone's whose job it is to make sure all of that stays within this like structural this right. framework. No, and I definitely think that like that vision is really crucial and key. And that's kind of why I was bringing up, say, the production aspect of it is that if yeah. you look at things in terms of just factory input or output, or you just look at people doing a lot of bunch of tasks, right, you're not going to have that key vision. And so yeah. for Cyberpunk 2077, I actually really think they do have that key vision. And that's kind of where they're at. Yeah. is that they had, right, the rough, the storyboarding, the sketches, like yeah. they're doing that final pass and now they're realizing some of those pieces don't fit and need to be right redone. Exactly. Versus a lot of in the industry, I think that, I'm not trying to say I think that it's losing its visionaries, but I think that because of the nature of the industry and with crunch, even those people that are the visionaries, right, if they're working 100 hours a week, right? What they're going to stop seeing, right? The whole picture, they're going to stop seeing their own vision. Yeah. And so I think that those same visionaries are now overworking and then will release a game that doesn't have a strong vision because they are overworking. So that's yeah. where, for me, when we look at Cyberpunk 2077, I'm like, man, I, you guys have a really strong vision. I can really feel it. Like, are you guys all working too much, right? So that now, did you miss things? And is that why you're re, right, going to have to do the delay? I mean, and I the think, controversy sorry. comes just because, right, we all know about it versus oh, yeah. this has happened in so many other studios. Yeah, I mean, it's the only the only reason it's a controversy is because their dirty laundry got aired. The reality is everyone has that dirty laundry, like every single game studio has it might they might have it to like a greater or lesser degree, but they all have it. And so in, in yeah. some form, I would like to say there needs to be hope. There is going to be studios <laughs> that that like they'll see their dirty laundry, they'll recognize it and they'll go, we need to wash this like we need to fix, <laughs> fix this dirty laundry. We got, we got to get it in the washer. We got to get in the dryer. Okay, <laughs> got to get in the washer. We got to let our air dry. We need to read the instructions like <laughs> we can't just but, let it go. Okay. On so let me, let me, okay, I'm taking off the Marxist hat for a second okay. and I'm putting on the different socialist hat, which is this is the perspective of <laughs> like the the political organizer. So uh, without revealing too much about myself, I also do a lot of organizing around um, social housing and public housing. Um, and the thing is, I think if I had to guess, given what you said, I think what has happened with the development of Cyberpunk 2077 is that 
the people who are responsible for like essentially like keeping everything in line in other words in terms of political organizing it's usually the person who sends the emails the person who like sends the text and make sure like everybody's on the same page make sure that everybody is like doing what they're supposed to be doing the person with the bullhorn who's like you know directing the protest if that person has like stressed out or broken down or is just generally burnt out the whole thing falls apart yeah the whole thing falls apart no that yeah. that is a hundred percent true and i mean like um and then I get, I mean, edit, right? I don't know like how much we'll edit of this, but like that is a hundred percent true that if the person that has the vision that is holding the bullhorn, leading the protest, that is, right, is the person that is making sure everyone's supposed to be on the same page. There are two ways they fail. One, it is true that if they get stressed out, they no longer can see the vision, yeah. right? But second is that they can't see the forest for the trees, right? Yes. They just get lost in the details. Exactly. When someone wants to micromanage that vision and make sure that every single aspect is correct, I think that that's completely different than someone who's like, hey, this is my vision. That was executed a lot differently than I thought it would be. Yeah. But it still meets the vision, right? And anybody that starts breaking that down recognizes that someone who wants to control it all and wants to be that micromanager could, right? It could just be in their personality. They're very detail and process oriented, but it also could be a symptom of imposter syndrome. Someone who's been promoted too quickly or someone who feels like, oh, I got my job and I've been really excited and I've made, it. or they're an imposter syndrome reverse because they have a really high ego. They're like, yeah. I did amazing on all of my past projects. I have 27 years of experience. There's no way I could fail. You need to put that tree to the left because that's how I would have done it. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's going to make a difference, right? And your level designer is like, um, that, okay, if I put that tree to the left, but then they'll go to the left because now it's wider over there. No, mm. of course they wouldn't. <laughs> you know, and then you get into that. Back exactly. Well, yeah, because you get to a point where you're no longer listening to to the people who, who you actually have to trust to, to do a certain degree of like, to make a certain number of decisions, like without yeah. your immediate input. And I, th if I, again, if I had to guess, I think part of that stems from like the, the, you know, the whole crunch mentality, like the closer you are to a deadline, a particularly like a hard deadline. Yeah. Um, you can even take a fairly reasonable person and they're just going to be like, this isn't working. I have to intervene to make it work. And I'm going to hurl myself into the process. Like, and because of that feeling to recognize that hurling yourself into the process and like sort of like bulldozing over a bunch of things that have already been done, you might actually be making the problem worse when you no, feel like you're making absolutely. it better. Yeah. And for me, I was a big fan of crunch and college, right? I am the epitome of a person, except for when studying languages, because you can't crunch study a language, which I found yeah. out the hard way, uh, <laughs> trying to crunch study a language. Um, you, that's just how I was. That's how I studied, because I don't study well by just looking over something and pouring over it and, you know, memorizing it and learning it that way. I was a fast learner, and I was like, I'm going to study for an hour, and then I'm going to watch TV for two. I'm going to study for an hour, I'm going to watch TV for two. Like, that's just how I worked. Yeah. And I think that for me, I always found that I felt like it was more crunchy. Like I got, I, you know, I would study really fast, really quickly. And then I would just take really long ass breaks. But then I think that I, when I brought that into the workplace, what I thought was like crunching was actually really like sustainably healthy. And it was, yeah, I was maybe there for like 12 hours, but I only really worked for six of those hours. Or I really only worked for say eight of them, which is like I say a standard day, yeah. but that was actually a lot longer than what I did in college. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying I like skirted by because there are plenty of days in college where as a writer, I just, you know, I spent 20, you know, four hours just writing continuously because you get into flow and you, you know, as a creative, you do that. But in games, especially with the technology and the screens, and it's not just like one type of aspect of your brain where it's really good in flow. It's what I work on is, is game design. So it's like the holistic vision of, of everything. Yeah. It has a lot of moving pieces. That's and even with programming or with art or animation, all of video game development is just a lot of moving pieces. And so it's not as yeah. exciting as just going, oh, yeah, I spent 20 hours on a drawing. 
I really got into that. It's I spent 20 hours on a drawing, then the tool messed up. So I had to spend four of those hours debugging so that I could go back to drawing. Yeah. Then I imported it. Oh, well, the engine failed. So now I had to re-export it out so that I could draw again, so that I could put it back into the engine. And then it just becomes, right, you're constantly, constantly problem solving. Yeah. And like our human brain was was meant to problem solve, but it wasn't meant to literally continuously problem solve for hours on end. Well, no, and the, it also doesn't account for the fact that, like, you know, different people have different brains, and yeah. they're differently abled, and they're differently disadvantaged, and you can't plug every single person into sort of like the same work framework. You know, yeah. you can't take someone with ADHD and sit them in a, you know, down at a desk for six hours straight and say, you know, work on your homework. It's not going to produce anything. Nope. Well, I mean, it nope. will produce something, but it'll all be crap. But to go back to the sort of like the problem of like, you know, what was revealed in all of like the sort of details that came out of like, you know, the dev team working on Cyberpunk 2077 is that like, why is it that particularly in like um, in a field where people in gen generally speaking are like obsessed with like human psychology, they're obsessed with all sorts of things that you would think would be related to all of these issues that we just talked about. And yet they can't actually design for themselves these coping mechanisms. In other words, they keep having the same problems over and over and over again, mm -hmm. when a lot of these bog standard, like I have to deal with them all the time, because as someone who teaches in um, an academic setting, like I often have to deal with like disability accommodations and every single time that I see them, I always think to myself, like, these are really just things that should be done for everybody. Like, like, why are these things just like, why, why isn't everyone allowed to like type out, you know, their exams? Like, why isn't everyone allowed to like do this through like an online interface? Why isn't everyone given like six days to work on this? Like, that's a better way of doing it. And the reason why it's a better way of doing it is because even for people who don't have like specific disabilities that or I don't want to call them disability, but particular things that they need to sort of like account for or, or cope with a lot. Like I was saying earlier is that when people are stressed or when people are tired or when people are just like generally frazzled or overworked, they exhibit exactly the same types of behaviors and the same types of problems. So if you just did that for everybody, like across the board, you would see far less stress and you would just generally see far greater productivity. I mean, ultimately the solution to a lot of these problems is hire more people. Um, but, and so there's, you know, there's an economic incentive, unfortunately, to not doing the right thing. But even if you, even if you left everything the way it is now, you could still build in a system where like you could actually but the problem is you would have to sort of retrain people how to work. You, you would have to sort of retrain them to like not keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing even when they're sort of falling apart. Honestly, and that's exactly where games is at right now is retraining how people work and also right retraining the expectations. I really think that you have these problems when people who are in a position of leadership or a position of power inevitably, right? Feel like they don't have a problem, right? Yeah or they don't recognize that there is a problem. And you can't, you know, unless they seek it out themselves, you can't just go to someone and say, hey, you have a problem, you should change. Yeah. I mean, like, if they're in a position of power, then you'll get fired and they'll never change, right? Yep. Uh, there we go. And even if they humble themselves and they go, there is a problem, I do need to change, and they try to change. I mean, working conditions for everybody below them, right, aren't gonna change overnight. No. And it's not gonna change overnight for that person either. And so it's all about those growth pains. And when you look at like the devs having to crunch for Cyberpunk 2077, it's actually you know pretty safe to assume that a lot of them, even though it's say mandated or forced crunch, they know their productivity level is going down and are right already reworking how they work, right at that studio, just yeah. like you would at other devs where it's like, hey, you have to be here 12 hours anyway, go take a two-hour lunch today, um, right, and then you'll clock out at eight or nine or 10 p.m. because you right like don't feel like you need to. But you can't do um, that haphazardly, and that's part of the problem. No, you can't. Yeah, you can't do that haphazardly. Um, and I think that, I don't know, I think that you're also really hitting a nail on the head, so to speak, with what systemic change is needed. Yeah. Because the huge problem about it is that I think unlike a lot of other industries, they're still also figuring out 
the best way to design a game or develop a game is that you also have game development and game developers who are like, we never crunched and we released a terrible product. We crunched a lot and released a terrible product. We didn't crunch at all and released a great product. We crunched all the time and our product was also great, yeah. right? And you have studios that are really you know, known for their crunch. And I really think that that's at the end. I really do think that we're turning a corner because of the way we're recognizing the way people learn. We are getting more people or the next gen of developers, so to speak, that honestly just won't work crunch. They'll be said, you're mandated to be here 12 hours and they'll go, okay, I'll be here 12 hours, but I'm only working for eight of them. Um, and that that's really hard like yeah. to say, right? But those people do exist. Like they don't just, you know, um, and that seems almost like, oh, well, they're not pulling their weight. If someone out there is listening to that and thinking, oh, well, they're not pulling their weight because they're only working eight hours. I'm like, they're honestly doing your game a favor because those extra four hours are horrible yeah. for whatever they end up putting in and you're going to have to fix it. Well, and it so, happened. Sorry, I, I just wanted to intervene yeah. to also say that like, in many ways, they're conscientiously recognizing that like, I'm not going to do the thing that will actually make the product worse exactly like by, by not working those four extra hours i'm not going to put myself in a position where i'm going to create problems that will have to be fixed later yeah that's really the turning point right that's really where we are at the industry where people who have been in this industry for 20 years are recognizing hey i can't do 10 hours of work if i only work well for six of them. Yep. And if you mandate me to stay here, those four hours will just be reviewing other people's content versus trying to put any right else into it. That could actually be good systemic change because sometimes, honestly, you need 10 hours, say, on a day because you're pushing for two weeks to get something out a door or the patch. It's only two weeks. Let's just like just to be clear. So we're not going and you do that for like 10 months now. Um, and you have those 10 hours, but only right four or six of them are working. And then right the remainder four to six, depending on what you did, are just reviewing or thinking or just making sure that like all the content you could be playing the game. That's yeah. stressful, but that's not necessarily the type of creative demands of work that are normally expected out of developers and studios that mandate you to crunch for 10 hours or, you know, any amount of time. Yeah. And, and when you have people that are have been in the industry, those that still think crunch is like a necessary evil or those that still say that crunch is good are either in what I just described where they're like, I'm, I've been here 10 hours, but I haven't really been doing any problem solving or flow or like consistent, really high detailed work that I really need to have my brain powered on at 100 all the time. Yeah. So obviously I can do this for 10 hours versus right someone who is a low level artist or a junior that's been given all of the implementation tasks that require high levels of detail, high levels of con uh, concentration, plus high levels, right, of creativity and yeah. problem solving, and maybe collaboration because they have to work with an engineer to even implement all that art or whatever, right? So now you're constantly talking to someone, and then that's just the nature of your work, not including, okay, are you an introvert or an extrovert, or like just how do you deal with people? Do you even like people? Yeah. Maybe you love people, but man, it's still going to take energy away from you. Yeah. Like, what is your diet like? What is your personal, like not even all of those things are included yeah. in the human cost, right, of development. Yeah. And yeah. so what I see now in the industry is people, at least whether or not they're in positions of power or not, I do see across the board, everybody looking at the human cost of development. Because like you said, the answer is to hire more people. But if we keep losing people to our own industry yeah. then the people that we hire on will have to train even longer yeah right and, and so it's better to retain and well also there's the long-term effects of like constantly putting people through cycles of burnout like if if your your normal working method is to sort of like have a slow build up to the point where like you know a couple years later people are working you know 60 to 80 hour weeks for a month and then they essentially detox and then it slowly builds up to that cycle again and then they detox and then it does it again. Like there are a lot of real, I mean, stress actually has long-term effects on your health. Also, it creates a lot of people who might get to a point where they're like, they could be really talented. They could be really good at their job, but they could also say to themselves like, do I want to keep doing this for the rest of my life? 
And so then you lose people from like the entire industry. Yeah. And you have to replace those people who have experience, they have institutional memory, they have all of the things that you actually want, just too much stress. And you have to then replace them with essentially people who are like green right out of school. Yeah. No. And actually, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, it's it's across the board what's happening to, to every, probably every industry out there that's been you know, I don't want to say tormented by burnout, but because I'm tormented by burnout. I mean, we could do a whole episode and we probably should on burnout. Maybe, I mean, I, we, I could talk about it right now. That's fine. But then air it later. Um, yeah. But we should do a whole episode on burnout because my life was burned out. Like my life was just constant doing everything, doing really fast. And then I'd get sick for a week and then yeah. I would do it all over again. And then I get sick for a week. Like that was just literally how I lived my, like my high school life. Yeah. Um, and then, in college, I got a lot better because I dropped all of my extracurriculars and then ran an anime convention, which I guess thought would I thought would be less stressful. Um, For our viewers, I should note that it was a very good anime convention and oh. it still exists and it's really fantastic. Oh, I, I, I regularly speak at this convention that shall not be named, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it's like Lauren did a very good job and should be praised heavily for it. But, oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, but that's because but, that's important to recognize is that like, I don't know, I, I wish, I mean, I'm an out, you know, I'm an outsider to this. Yeah. I, can, I can only look at it through like, you know, wh what is reported to me and through what I read, um, what you say, but it's like, I don't know, it seems like the solutions are so obvious, but I also know at the same time, because I work in academia, like the solutions are always obvious, but the problem of like, institutional inertia that prevents you from actually implementing any of them is strong it yes. is incredibly strong and it's not because people are evil it's not because in fact in many ways it's because it's an, a completely amoral system like yep. it resists you because it doesn't actually acknowledge what is good or bad it just yes. is what it is no exactly and so this actually goes perfectly back into what we were talking about i don't know if it was last episode or, or the week before the last episode where previously, we were talking about the pre podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, previously on the furry dashi podcast we were talking about the uh scare quotes here exodus from blizzard of all of these yep. really highly talented people that were leaving to start their own studios and it's not just Blizzard. There's a lot of companies out there that are getting started from really high profile people that are now in charge of their own, like, you know, baby, their own studio, so to speak. And honestly, for a lot of those industry vets, who wouldn't want that? Yep. But for these new companies that I'm seeing start out, you, and I'm not going to name the company here, but their front page just says, we have values. Like, that's, that's what the, um, that's what their like mentality is. And I laughed because it's one hilarious, but two, I actually laughed because it really hit a little dagger in my heart. It was very true that I was like, thank you. You're a company that has values. Like you're not an amoral institution. That's like, we believe in bold creativity and changing the status quo. We believe. I'm like, no, 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 no. This company's just like, look, we got values. We want your talent. We're going to make great games. It's going to be fine awesome like that's it and i'm like thank yeah. you and and honestly it was like we have values we don't like bullshit and like that was what it meant to me that's what i read when i read this company webpage that was like welcome to our company we have values here i read we're not going to take your bullshit and i was like yes this is the future like that's the future of AAA development and not not a future maybe that's five years out it could be a future that's 10 years out where more companies are not amoral companies or more i'll call them creative studios or creative houses i think that institutional inertia is really high in a lot of the huge companies that you see right like the blizzards or the square enixes or ubisoft right yeah. ubisoft being the big one that came out this summer with institutional inertia um kind of just you know being thrown in the public face of what was allowed and yeah. then right now they're trying to back away and they're trying to change some of that but then there's also a lot of companies that right maybe haven't met diversity um and haven't you know don't have values but don't really authentically believe in those values versus i see these new startups and the one thing that happens in a lot of the hiring processes is they're like we believe in 
right, these very specific things. We actually believe in inclusivity, diversity. Here are the action steps we're taking, and they're actually showing that in the interview. And I think bringing more of the value talk into game development is going to be really, really crucial because that's the human cost. That's someone, if you believe in diversity and inclusion and really showing all of these unique stories, you're going to want to bring that into the game world or into like the product that you're creating. I suppose then I, I see what you're saying, but I being the more cynical of, of the two of us. Yes. Like, I just, I don't believe it. I mean, and I think that's really what it boils down to. It's like, I see what you did there. I don't believe it because at the end of the day, I, I believe something when I see it actually like materially yep. manifested. I, I totally feel you because and, there's a lot of people getting hired by those companies that are like, you know what? I'm not going to lie to you, Lauren. This company says they want to promote and hire more women's women are still a mi minority here. And like, that's great. Uh, yeah. Cause I guess the nature of the business and they're just like, you know, and I just don't really believe it. Like I, I will believe it when I see it. Are they taking the actions? Right. Well, because, okay. So there, there is a, there's a fundamental issue here. Okay. So, I mean, I'm a materialist. So I always look at this thing from a material perspective, which is that like, so it's one thing to say that you want to like hire a more diverse, like employee base, a more diverse workforce. But the problem is, is that especially in industries where like, certain demographics are woefully underrepresented be that like you know african americans or women or just go down the list like right the problem doesn't exist at the point of hire the problem is that it exists basically at like the the lowest yes. strata. Yep. and if you're not doing anything to actually like build that then you're never going to get the people who will be applying for and doing those things in the first place. Yes. Because then what will oh, end up happening? Because then what will end up happening is that also you'll have like the people with you'll have the institution because you see this in academia as well. You see the institutions with the most money and the most clout, then like essentially snap up as many people as they can to function essentially as tokens. And then it doesn't really go anywhere because they haven't done anything to say like, you know, Wanda would be, I would believe any of these companies, really any of these companies, if instead of saying like, you know, we're committed to a diverse workforce, if, if they just like got rid of all of that BS and instead like essentially like put money into like, I don't know, like game design courses for like schools where yes. like African-American kids are woefully like overrepresented. Like if you went into say yep. like schools in the South, like schools in Chicago, like, and just literally said like, we are going to give you say, I don't know, $10 million to like institute, like we're going to give you all of the like equipment that you need. We're going to give you the resources. We're even going to give you the people that you need to teach them. And we're going to put these people in your schools and we're going to make this freely available to you. So that way we can actually perform some form of like reparations essentially. Then I would believe it. No, I, I absolutely think that you're correct because there's a lot of companies out there that are just doing the lip service. And funnily enough, just to, this is not a like a diatribe, but I was reading The Economist the other day. And did you know that apparently Microsoft and I know it was Microsoft and one other company were saying that they were going to take steps like from the Black Lives Matter movement to make sure that they not only like met, but exceeded to make sure they had more uh, black and African-American like diverse hires in leadership positions, not just in um, mm. like just not just as like token, like they were doing this thing. And the reason why it made the economists like tiny news section was that the United States government actually now put those companies under review because they didn't want them to discriminate based on race. And I was just like, yeah. oh my gosh, like that's one, oh, like that's not, that's not when you put the company under review to discriminate based on race. Yeah. I mean, but that's the thing is that I think that's precisely why you have to attack the problem from like yes. the, the base as Mark yep. would say. Like you can't I, do no, it super I, I absolutely agree with you. And for me, like that's, what's really important about a company is that a company can't just say, we're going to hire all of these people that are super diverse. Um, or, right, there's this thing called where companies are accidentally diverse. I was actually just talking about a company that I accidentally worked for. Accidentally diverse? Yep. Like, whoops, right, called, we tripped. We, found all we, these we, people we, we fell into <laughs> diversity. Where do they come from? No, it's, 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 it's hilarious because it's, I, I was like, you know, this is going to sound hilarious, but let's call it accidental diversity. And it's a company okay. where there is a majority or 
or rather is is a really good equal like equal it less like 45 to say 55 percent we're 55 actually actually, de- actually demographically right? is representative actually you know, demographically yeah. representative of you say what we'll say the united states of america but you could also say like you know the the area california or, yeah. or washington or texas or whatever is actually demographically representable and has a majority of women right in the studio and has a huge like per people of color huge from people that are from other countries lots of visa holders yeah. like this is crazy but you have those companies and i call it almost accidental diversity not because it's like oh well we weren't trying to be and we just happened to hire these people but that like it represents the people that work there have those friend groups that are just diverse they're just a huge diverse network of people and so that when you see the politics or the political weight shift is when a company then expands and now you can see the shift of power so before right where a company is accidentally diverse it just is a diverse company the more and more people that get hired where is the they're going to get hired from people that are in power and if the diverse people are in power this is when you actually see the power dynamic shift back to, I don't want to say back to what is currently also demographically represented, but back to the right white male dynamic, where yeah. now you realize that as more white males are hired, more white males are hired, right? And yeah. then more white males are hired. Oh, yep. and then there's one female. There's the ballroom dancing African American. Like, that's yeah. great. We've got our two, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, we're, we're good now. Uh, you know, for every like 10, like, you know, and, and what's hard about it is that I get it. It's your network. It's your comfort zone. It's, it's the people, you know, right. And you want to hire the people, you know, but on the flip side, that's when you start to see that even in a company that has a lot of say amazing, talented, diverse people, yeah. when those people aren't internally promoted into power and when those people aren't yeah. internally encouraged, right. And grown into being leaders, the leaders don't hire more diverse people. The no. leaders hire other leaders that are just like them. And it, it no. right? in, in a way, and that's not to say every company is that way with diversity, but I think it's exactly like you're talking about when it happens to happen at the base, yeah. because internally it needs to happen at the base. It needs to happen with your diverse hires you already have. Yeah. And then externally, the company needs to look outside and go, the problem isn't just with hiring. The problem is that we don't have the people to hire because the people that would bring the best amount of diversity and actual uh, like true novelty and look at this through fresh eyes are the people that don't even have the opportunity or the availability of resources. Or the awareness of that as a possibility. Yeah. Honestly, for me, I was in that bucket. I, I was like, I can't program, so I can't be in games. Yeah. And so then imagine adding like, every disadvantage in life to that and of course like you're not going to have like a brilliant say black woman working as a level designer because there's like a 90 percent chance that she isn't even aware of the fact that that is a possible thing she could have done with her life she could be talented she could be predisposed to doing it but because like the connections that you have to make from like where you begin in your education to where you end up, like none of those are clear for for her because of her situation in life. And so that's why it has to be attacked at that starting point. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, what you just said right there is absolutely why I'm actually still on Instagram. It's why I took a course on Instagram, why I'm on Instagram. And it sounds really silly and it sounds really stupid, but a lot of women are on Instagram. A lot of them are looking at fashion posts. A lot of them are wanting to do cosplay because that is something people are aware of, right? Especially women. They're like, if I take photos of myself, I'll get likes. I need to follow women who take photos of themselves because they get likes and I want to know what they do. And I want to be like, hey, you know what? I'm finally learning how to be self-confident and I'm going to start taking photos of myself. But guess what? I don't actually do this for a living. I do something called game design, right? Like it's (laughs) all about spreading awareness. And they're like, oh, so how do you program? And I was like, hey, I actually don't code a single line. And you know what? And now, now, it doesn't mean I can't code. I'm being slightly (laughs) dishonest there. (laughs) I'm being slightly dishonest. It doesn't mean I can't code, right? Um, But it, it means that, right, you can make a successful career without, say, being the best programmer right and that's for me that's the awareness because especially as a woman you know when you're told you can't do something and you're told it over and over again not only do you want to do it 
you want to do it so well that they can never deny the fact that they told you that they couldn't do it. Yeah. And so you get into that mindset. For me, it really was, it wasn't so much about programming um, or about like writing or, or either of those. It was really actually about systems design. I was told that as a woman, like I would never be able to really get the logical systems thing. That was just something men did, which made okay. no sense to me, but whatever. And it was also from this guy that like, wanted to be a systems designer and was probably threatened by me at the time. And, you know, looking back on it, right. You're like, ah, yes. I believe but, that is known as a douchebag. Yes. <laughs> <A> bag of <laughs> douches. <laughs> it was a bag of, yep. Uh, nice, nice big bag of douches. <laughs> and um, anyway, but that being said, in my brain, I went, I have to be a systems designer now. Not because I want to be though. I ended up loving it because I was just like writing to me. It was very formulaic. It required me to go on paper and then yeah. I could put it into the engine and transcribe it. But um, because I was like, I was told you couldn't do it. And I was like, well, now I have to be the best. And you get caught up in being the best of something, but not actually recognizing, is that actually what I, right, Lauren, is that what I want to do? And so it's about spreading awareness of like, hey, I have made all of the mistakes. I was fortunate in life that my parents made a ton of mistakes and then like told me all of their mistakes that they ever made. And then I decided to make ones they didn't even think you could make because they, (laughs) you know, technology and game design, right. Are things that are crazy. And for me, spreading the awareness that as a woman, like you can do these things as a minority, you can do these things from a mixed family background. You can do these things. Even if someone's just like, Oh, you know what? I'm not going to be a game developer, but you know what? I know that I could be, right? Yeah. Like that's huge because like their network of people now, they'll talk to other women or other minorities and go, hey, I could be a game developer. And they'll go, what, you? Like, you know, and then they'll go, no, no, no. There's actual people that are like me, or, or right? Alter- or alternatively, when someone else comes along and says like, hey, I, I'm interested in this thing. Like, I don't know. I kind of want to do like art for video games. That person then won't immediately shut them down. They'll be like, oh, that's really cool. That's really awesome. Yeah. You should do that. And that's really yep. how, like people need that. They need someone yeah. to just say like, oh, hey, that's cool. You should do that and be like, oh, yeah, that is cool. I should do that. Exactly. Honestly, yeah. I said I wanted to be a writer and, and you know, for a lot of my life, a lot of it was spite. They're like, oh, so you're going to be an English teacher. And I was like, no, that's not why I'm going to go into English. I don't want to teach English. Like who wants to teach English? No offense, no English teacher. Like, no one wants to teach English. We, we would like to go on the record and note that we are very anti-English teachers. <laughs> We're just kidding. <laughs> No, just kidding. I loved all my English teachers, except for uh, that, that one TA in that one course. Um, but Yikes. sorry, uh, it was pretty. Oof. Yeah, I, uh, I started an essay with like, yeah, I just really dumbed down my writing and I got like a 99. Yeah. yeah, it was really bad. So minus that one person, I love you guys, English teachers. Mrs. Brill, if you're listening, you are still great and good in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Sorry, but yeah, so I, I was like, no, I'm not going to be an English teacher. Oh, okay, so you want to be a writer? And they're like, oh, so you're going to be a journalist. And I was like, no, I'm not going to be a journalist. I'm going to do creative writing, like get off my back. Oh, so you're going to write the next great American novel. No, I don't know what that is, and I'm not going to write it. Um, you know, this is high school, Lauren. Like, yeah. what, is, what is a novel? I would have um, liked to have known high school, Lauren. High school, Lauren was pretty cool. I mean, a little like, you know, spiteful, uh, you know, a little high school. <laughs> I don't know. I um, like spiteful people. I am a spiteful person. So. Uh, no, so I, I was going to do everything that wasn't the thing that people said that they assumed that I was going to do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's also why I didn't become a doctor because when I was a kid, I was like six years old, people assumed I would be a doctor because my parents were doctors. Yeah. And so I was like, no, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm not going to sit in a lab for eight hours and try to like mix chemicals. Like, and here I am like brewing different types of cro- coffee grounds together, which is basically mixing chemicals. But yeah. coffee is, is excellent. Well, it's organic. It's organic chemistry. It's, organic. it's different. It's, it's organic. different. Yeah. It's good. Oh yeah. Organic chemistry is a hard, <laughs> hard class, a whole different thing. <laughs> but point, point being um, a lot of my life was right. Living like that. And I think that that's great. I'm glad that I have that character, but I didn't always have people that were like, you can be a creative writer, right? If anything, I actually had people telling me you can't write science fiction because that's not a worthy genre to write in, right? Um, You know, we, we've talked about that before, but also like you can't be a systems designer because since you're so good at narrative, you should really just stay in your lane. Right. And Oh, Mm, I, I mean, that for me, that that's that's the spike coming out. It's the no, I'm not going to stay in my lane. I'm going to drive this car everywhere I want to, and you can't stop me because yeah. um, it's a metaphor. And the lanes, there are no cliffs, and everything's going to yeah, be yeah. okay, 
right? So outside of a school setting, what you recognize is that's still true in game development, which is a lot of the reason why crunch even persists is that they're like, hey, no, you were just hired to, uh, to be X, stay in your lane, right? Yeah. And for some people, if that's all they want to, like they're, say they're a principal because they're really good at it, they will just stay in their lane like by nature, right? Yeah. Like they, that's what they want. But I think for game design in general, even those people that stay in their lane will peer over, look at something being done and go, hey, I, I could make that better, right? Yeah. That person needs to go, you could make that better. But if that person's like, stay in your lane, well, now they're shut down and now they'll do their job worse, right? Yeah. Because they're going, oh, I don't actually matter. I don't actually contribute. So, and, yeah, sorry. Um, there's, so so there's, the, go ahead. Uh, the, the last thing I was going to say was just that, and that's why crunch is so persistent and yeah. so institutionalized, is that when you're crunching, when you want to look over to someone else and you want to comment, you won't because there is so much in your lane to deal with. There is no valid, like, validation for doing it. And yeah. then if you do do it anyway, right, and you go over to someone else's lane and go, hey, I can help you or I can make that better, that person has so much in their lane, they're not going to accept your help or they'll accept your help, but will never take any of your stuff. So now you've got someone else's lane of stuff and now you're crunching twice as hard yeah. and that person is still crunching, but crunching less. So now you feel right, like you're doing more, even though it was because you chose to do it yeah. but also because that person's tired and isn't recognizing you could collaborate and so the institutionally it's just about keeping people in the lanes right and that's where yeah that's where it, you know it stays so i was going to add that in um in political discourse there is this thing known as the iron law of institutions and what that refers to is the fact that there is this perverse tendency within like established organizations where people will often behave in such a way where they will try, they will do everything in their power to sort of maintain or improve their status within the organization, even to the detriment of the organization yes. as a whole. Yep. And so, yeah, there, there is this perverse incentive where like, because you know, the organization itself is not going to magically disappear. And, but at the same time, the the attempt to sort of improve the institution and therefore improve things for everybody like there's risk involved there but there's actually far less risk involved in just you sort of like siloing yourself and like protecting your territory and protecting your turf even if it means that like ultimately the organization that you're a part of will say 10 maybe even five years down the line completely falls apart and in games, because it's so rapid, it it's not five or 10 years. Yeah. It could be five to 10 months, Yep. right? And that's why you have like layoffs and that's why you have game studios shutting down even if they have say huge financial backing is that you see these people staying in their lanes or protecting their turf. You see people getting promoted because they had the title that was allowed to be promoted in an X number of years yeah. and then suddenly are doing a role and a job they actually have never done. But because they were protecting their turf and it was part of their turf, right? Yeah. Now it is to the detriment of the organization that yeah. they are existing there. And likewise, it could be that, oh, well, maybe they don't want to protect their turf and maybe they are, right? Uh, they, they're just hired on to be that. Well, now they've come in at a different company culture. They're bringing another company culture with them, right? So you're going to have that tension. Yeah. And then they're, say, best friends with the boss. Well, like, right in an, in, 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 I'm sorry, in an additional scenario, then you could have someone who's just best friends with the boss that also right, creates cultural tension. Yeah. And so anything that creates that tension, right, is other ways of showing that like those things that seem like they're safer and lower risk because you're hiring an expert, yeah. right? That expert, right, like, leaving a company and coming to yours or internally promoted as an expert, it's still a different role. It's still a different job, right? Yeah. So are they, are they protecting their turf? Are they doing it? Is the company doing it there instead of saying, oh, what is the higher risk option of right promoting a lot of people or increasing all of our size or hiring more people in, right? Why hire five people when you can hire one expert? But like, honestly, at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're, we're making a game. Like, you know, moving to the tree to the left, we, we think this, the moving the tree to the left stands for something bigger or stands for other things, right? And it could be, making a well, female it does. character yeah i mean it, it, does, stands, right? it stands for a lot of things it stands for a lot of things but at the end of the day 
everybody recognizes that what we do, we're not doing heart surgery, right? We're not, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe we will save someone's life with our game, and that would be incredible. I right? fundamentally disagree. But um, please go on please, with what you're. Please, please go on with what you were saying. Awesome. I want you to disagree with this. But at the end of the day, where people come down to in their in their brains is that well, I'm just making a video game. Like, is this really a problem? Yeah. And this is where I look at a lot of organizations that have that perpetuated crunch when you're stressed, you're overworked. And this isn't your first time moving a tree to the left. This is like your 50th time yeah. moving a tree to a left. And now at this point, you're like, look, I've brought it up 49 times. I've gotten shot down all 49. Well, yeah. now you're, you're already beaten down. You're lower. And you know what? Now, ethically, for yourself and for your team and for others, you just have to keep going because cosmically, you're like, look, I just can't work here anymore. So I'm already out. If you had those three, 10 or 300 people, right, actually raising that power to the, the, the head, I yeah. think the head recognizes it and goes, you were all right. All right, we'll move the tree back to its original position, yeah. right? And that does happen in games, yeah. right? When you do have those departments. Yeah. But crunch with overexertion, overstress, right? That person is stressed and is like, no, you're just doing it my way. And really says, you know, I am Zeus, king of gods, you will do this, <laughs> yeah. right? Well, now suddenly you have 300 people that are just completely burned out, completely yeah. exhausted. And they're like, you know what? Just, just do what Zeus says and it'll get better. Yeah. It'll, it'll just, we'll just... <laughs> Well, right? they don't necessarily acknowledge that it'll get better, but they'll at least say, well, we'll at least get by. Like, at least yeah, we'll continue. We'll get by. We will persist. We will continue. We will persist. So the reason why I would, I want to push back on one thing, and that's the sort of the notion that like, oh, it, it, well, it ain't heart surgery. It's like, or, or it's, or it's less important. That may very well be the case. Like ultimate value to society may be less than, I don't know replacing someone's brain or yeah. something. I don't and know. And I will make the argument that I I think we actually are of the same brain, but please disagree with what I said. But the reason why I want to disagree is because this this way of thinking is actually something that capitalism does to us. It sort of forces it sort of it compels us to believe that certain forms of labor are more valuable than others yes. by rewarding them differentially. And it sort of for and what it does is that it, it creates this perverse situation where we're not actually evaluating the labor we perform based upon its value to society. We evaluate it entirely based upon essentially like how much somebody gets paid to do it. Yeah. And so and so even even if ultimately making a video game is not as important, having that mindset is not good. It, it's actually a terrible mindset to have. And I notice this all the time. Like I got in an argument when I was still teaching at Syracuse, like physically, I got an argument with one of my students who I actually really liked. And I, I think actually liked me as a teacher because he was studying, you know, an important STEM field. And I literally said in class at one point to sort of like poke the bear, like, actually what you want to do is no more important than someone who works at a fast food restaurant. And he was livid. He got livid with me. And I'm like, okay, well, let's think about this for a second. Let's set money aside. What do you think is more important? Someone who like codes a database or someone who makes food for you? Which of those two things is more valuable to you as a human being? And he was kind of flabbergasted because he, it never occurred to him to think about labor in those terms. Because yep. the thing is like, yeah, somebody who makes your hamburger, like that is a valuable service that they provide to society. Someone who takes care of your kids, that is a valuable service they provide to society. Do you know what those jobs pay? They pay zilch. They pay well, That nothing. is like one of the most valuable things that we can have in our society is someone who will take care of your family well, right? Like they're not just secretly abusing your kids, right? Yeah. And then someone who will feed you and feed others because you need food to survive, right? I think we need to stop saying that like we disagree with each other because I brought that up specifically because so many people, because of the capitalist nature of video games, yeah. right? Especially with artists and level designers is that that is how they think. They go, well, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm not performing heart surgery regardless of what you're paid because it's very possible that here in the bay area some engineers are making just as much if not more as like an esthetician yeah. like and i think that um i i think that that's really crucial because for me what i do every day in making video games is really important to me like being a creative writer or being a yeah. game developer for me like it is it is the <sighs> So I'll put it in terms of like Disney terms, which is then like, oof, that's already like very capitalistic. But yeah. what when I watch like the Mandalorian behind the scenes, when I watch the Disney Imagineering, right? When I watch these documentaries of these 
incredible theme parks being built or this movie or all of this, you have everyone coming together that is like, no, we're sharing an experience. We're telling a story. We want people to feel and to recognize, right, this emotion and this love and this dedication of like the characters of a world, right? People don't, when people really believe in something that benefits society, they don't talk about things like, well, we wanted to create an environment in which people could walk around and have some fun and buy popcorn. Like, that's not what they say, right? They say, we wanted to have people feel the magic, right? Like, that's the Disney thing. But that's because those people actually believe they're benefiting society, right? Just like a doctor would be like, you know, when I went to war, and I healed all those soldiers, like, I mean, he was right, benefiting them, like personally, but benefiting, say, like the cause or what he believed in. He doesn't talk about it as like, oh, I just stitched some people up. Right. I mean, maybe, maybe they, that he would, but he would also be like, no, like I continued right the world. I won the war. Right. Yeah. Like it's very personal. Yeah. And I think that in games, so much of it, uh, so much of games because of the, right. There is the first person shooter genre and a lot of right war analogies in, in games, yeah. right. From call of duty and stuff like that. But a lot of it is like, oh, you're in the trenches together yeah. and, and those get made all the time. Right. You have that solidarity. But, but well, so, no, so I, much, and- and, and yeah. I would add, and I would add to that, like, okay, so because we live, uh, sorry, I, I, this is not a Marxist podcast, but I guess I turned it into one. But because we live under capitalism, like, also one of the things that it does to us is it, it tries to atomize us as individual, but the, individuals, but we are fundamentally social creatures. So strangely, one of the thing, and we talked a little bit about this in ter- when we talked about sort of like the para quasi sociality of mm-hmm. like especially online games, is that they those sorts of games actually provide a an avenue of socialization for people that they don't otherwise have precisely yep. because the social order that they live in is trying to keep them apart from one another. Yeah. Or alternatively, there there are like therapeutic aspects to games. I, I've mentioned this in the past, but like my daughter learned to read because of a Pokemon game. Yep. That is a real thing that happened. That game was not designed to do that. No one intended that for that to happen. And I keep bringing this up, or, or like there's another example of, um, so I, I don't know if I've brought this up before, but so the voice actor, Ashley Birch, gave this really amazing talk in which she actually talked about the fact that like playing, I believe it was Harvest Moon, like helped her get over her anxiety issues as a kid. Or like, again, I'm a Jane McGonagall detractor, but it's she has a similar story as well in, in her own book. Like there are real meaningful expressions in people's lives that video games have like video games actually do do these things so this idea that somehow it's like not valuable because it's entertainment or because it's merely like a cultural product i you can't buy that on its face honestly honestly it's bullshit and like i bring it up and i'm glad that we talked about it because when you as a game developer start thinking that way your product will have no value or no service in some way you start thinking which way start thinking about like if you start if you start thinking of no if you start thinking in the way of like you're burned out from crunch you're like i'm just making a video game okay it doesn't bring any value say like as a as a fast food worker as a as my babysitter as a caretaker as a database coder yeah database coding um sorry database it, coding it, is also valuable by the way it is all it's all actually it's incredibly <laughs> valuable uh if you know sequel hit me up no uh <laughs> <laughs> um but when you start thinking that way, right? Yeah. When crunch makes you start thinking that way, you didn't get into games because you were like, oh, I, I don't want to have any meaning on society. That's not why you do things yeah. as a human, right? You want to make an impact as a human. Yeah. So the last thing you're going to do is go, oh, I don't want to have any value on society. So I'm going to get a bachelor's and a master's so that I can go become a game developer to have no value on society, just a lot yeah. of debt. Like that's my goal. That's not, no, that's not your goal crunch makes you believe and to your extent right capitalism atomizes you and makes you believe that you do not have as value as something else and that is when you no longer bring value because you don't believe that what you do brings value and so for to me that is literally my daily mantra is like every single thing i do has to bring value and I, I don't know. It's just, even if it's um like playing Pokemon, honestly, like <laughs> I am bringing value to myself, right? I am bringing value to myself. Yeah. I mean, not, not games. everything needs to be like dire. Like it doesn't have no. to yeah, be like yeah, yeah, serious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I use those it's examples so... mostly because they sort of make it, make it stark, but also at the same time, like all of the little things that contribute to human culture 
that like make our society what it is and that make us like participants within it. Like those all have value because there, there, there is no one cause, there are no like singular cause and effect relationships. Yeah. Like you are the way you are because a whole of a confluence of things in your life. And one of those things may very well be that you play video games. One of those things may very well be that you work a shitty job at a fast food company. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. those things all contribute to who you are as a human being. And so they have value if only for that reason. No, I, I, absolutely. And yeah. that's, that's kind of what I was saying is that like when, regardless of which industry and crunch and overexertion and stress, right, lead to the devalue of the human component of yeah. your workforce. Yeah. It just completely devalues you crunch devalues the worker, whether it's overworking at a fast food restaurant, right? Or overworking at your startup or overworking in games. Like it devalues who you are yeah. because it is completely, it's de-social, right? It's siloing. Yeah. And so, yeah. So for me, I think that, yeah, for me, I think that when you publicly announce that you do have to crunch, it's just one of those, it, it's just, a, it's a horrible return on investment. Um, yeah. So, but the, but then the question is like, I don't want to, I don't, I mean, it's, it's easy to be all doom and gloom. It's like, this is the problem. And like, that's a very, I mean, in many ways it's a very academic approach. Like here are all the problems. No, Bye. academia is all about, <laughs> these are all the problems, right? No, I left, I, I don't like academia for here are all the problems. Mic drop. <laughs> exactly. That's it. We're just but, here to talk about problems, not solutions. <laughs> because also like, you know, both for, for like me and, you know, my political work, but then also in my academic work, like, and even in like the, the things that I translate for me, the question is like, okay, what am I doing to actually rectify that? And so yeah. like, for me, the political solution, strangely enough, is the most obvious because like there are models that you can already like, like there, there are already models for how to do political organizing. You just then do sure. them. But then the question is like within a particular institution, within an organization, particularly one that is built around, you know, the, the profit motive and that needs people to be exploited in a particular way in order for the profit motive to work at all. How do you actually carve out a space for those people to essentially band together to resist it, to resist either resist the profit motive or at least resist the exploitation that occurs as a result? And I don't have yeah. a good answer to that question. Yeah, honestly, for me, like, I, I don't know if I have a good answer either, but like, that's what gets me excited about working in games, I guess, right now, or looking at those new companies that are, are moving up is that your argument assumes that a profit motive needs the exploitation of its workers to be successful. And what well, I'm not actually my argument, seeing, that's Marx's well, argument. You know, it's Mar <laughs> Marx is sorry. Okay. Yes. But you know, you are now Marx. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, I am Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I am Carl. <laughs> Hello. Hello, I am I am, um, I am joined podcast. So the Marxist argument right assumes right that the profit motive is inherently evil, right? That it needs the exploitation of its workers. Not that it's and once evil. That, no, 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 no. Okay. Right. This okay. I I want to be very clear for for, for our, our okay. listeners so that again, because it goes back to what we were saying earlier about sort of like the amorality of institutions. It's not that it's bad and it's not that it's good. It's that it's there's a mechanic there. And that the mechanic, in, like in order for like, so if you have okay, a, a okay. Fin, if you have a finite pool of resources, and then with that finite pool of resources, you then produce a product. The only way for like, say, one or a group of individuals to essentially like have a larger share of that total production than everybody else is if a certain number of people are exploited in the way that they are not receiving the full share of their labor. I mean. That, that's just that's just a basic mechanic. And so one way to solve this, if you didn't want to go the whole like, let's do communism route, is you could essentially just have like profit sharing. In other words, the company could be structured in such a way where like all of the profits are equally distributed amongst all of the people who right, work there. Right, right. Okay, I see what you're saying now with more. And of that's like, within capitalism. I think yeah. it is. It is within capitalism, right? And so I think that, so now that I, I kind of understand exactly what you were kind of looking at with the solutions, yeah. like for me, I mean, yes, profit sharing is one model. I, I always come at it from more of a, a human aspect of it. And for yeah. me, what I was looking at is like, when you're designing a studio or you're creating a culture or a company or just hanging out with your friends and are like, we have an idea, let's write something up, right? Yeah. Um, you're, you're looking at it from like a very basic premise, which is just that like, hey, we want to make money off of something or hey, we want to just get something out there and we want to do something. Yeah. I don't think inherently that, <laughs> I don't think inherently that like crunch ever needs to happen. 
And I don't think inherently that like the exploitation of workers, even if they are finite, need to happen. I think what comes from that is like curbing, it's curbing that expectation. It's curbing like the profit motive, right? Yeah. I think profit sharing is a good example of something where when you have a lot of overwork that's going to happen, right? Like it's just the nature of it, or you know there are going to be areas where you do right, increase the amount of workload and labor, profit sharing is a great way to, right, share that money and to share the profit for those people. Yeah. But when you're looking at inspiring an organization or you look at the inspiration factor, right, like you can't inspire people by saying, it's cool that you're going to work 80 to 100 hours a year, like you're going to get 10%, you know, from, from our profit, like don't yeah. worry about it because we're going to make billions of dollars, yeah. right? Game is an 80 billion industry. People really aren't motivated by money right people don't really they do desire money but they don't really desire physical money they desire no. what comes with the money right yeah. and they're not motivated by i just want stacks of i mean not everyone i guess i'll have to say maybe I, some by the way i want to go on the record and say that i just want stacks of cash so if you want to <laughs> mail me fat stacks um i will give you my address you can slip into my dms just Sorry. a little bit of my DMs that you can give me fat stacks of cash, but yeah, no, we, we are but, uh, we are we on the Foodie Dutch <laughs> podcast are very pro cash. <laughs> we are pro cash, um, but what I'm saying is I I don't want to just stare at the money, right? You want to buy yeah. things like I would buy all of the omakase, like the the sushis, right? Yeah. I would buy like everything, right? Yeah. And I th- that, that's the point is that when you're motivated by profit sharing that's not really a motivational factor. Sure, it's a solution, but it's just like kind of band-aiding, right? That inspiration factor of getting everybody to not want to, you know, to not be exploited. I think it is a solution to one of the problems we identified though. And that's sort of the stability question, Mm -hmm. which is that it sort of, it goes back to that, like, you know, again, our hapless level designer. So our hapless level designer, like in the current environment may in fact be terrified of their boss or maybe terrified of like, speaking out precisely because of all of the things that you very eloquently identified. Um, however, if you have a, an organization that is structured in such a way where that same individual like shares equally with everyone else is, and is on an equal playing field with everybody else, there is less, and if they can't just be sort of like immediately fired because of some power dynamic, then it creates a situation in which they are more likely to speak up. They're more likely to be actively involved in in a productive creative process Mm. rather than a sort of self-destructive creative process. Right. Because they have that base of stability to rely upon. And it also helps in terms of like, you know, you may still have people who are in like decision-making roles, but I don't know. Like you're right. Like there, there, you do reach a point where like making more money doesn't actually make much of a difference. And I think, yeah. And I guess that's for me, like, it's funny that I'm glad that you actually mentioned more of like the processes and the stability, because for me, when I tackle issues like this, I never really look at the, the minutia, like the every day. I'm just really bad at that. I mean, I forget to take my like medicine every day, like my vitamins, like, uh, you know, we all um, do like that. And stuff, right? And we all do that. But I mean, like, I very consistently forget to do the routine things of everyday life. I just, I'm not worried about that. Right. Yeah. And I think that when I go to an organization and I'm in an organization, like, yes, there's, you got bonuses and profit sharing and like all of that. I, I call them little dilly dallies, like all the little cute things, right. That they're like, yeah. look at all of our company. We have all these benefits. And I'm like, do I have healthcare? Do I have vision? Cause I need glasses. Um, do I have salary? Like, okay. That like, there's, I, yeah. I get that that's the, for me, that's the fluff, but it's not actually the fluff, it's stability. Because when I look at solving an institutional problem, I want to know what the heads are thinking. I want to know how do you create a culture and create that direction, right? And that, that flow of energy that makes the solution like profit sharing seem almost like essential, just like, you know, like it's not even um, a non sequitur. It's just, it's there. It's natural. Yeah. It's just natural. Yeah. Right. How do you make a culture and in an institution and a system that's just organic and natural for that? And for me, like, I don't think it happens with just one person being a visionary. No. And I don't want to say that the age of visionaries are over because I am a visionary and, and I don't want to be over. <laughs> but I do wanna... You, you want to be the last of the age of visionaries. I, I will be the last. Right. <laughs> um, but what I do want to say is that I think that visionaryism isn't something that's going to be defined by one person, right? Leading the charge. I think it's going to be dozens, right? Mm -hmm. Of people that are leading that charge, right? Because it's about inspiring others to make the choices that you could never make yourself. And if you don't have that in the, at the institutional level, and you have that systemically within your organization, 
you know, profit sharing will work, but then there's only so much money you can make. That's not going to motivate people, yeah. right? There are only so many practices or, you know, leadership expos you can take your, you know, team to or team building exercises or oh cool slogans you can put on the wall, right? Like there's so much, there's only so much lip service you can do before it just becomes lip service yeah. versus actual inspiration and actual empowerment, right? And so for me, it comes to empowering the bases, just like you were said, empowering the basic status quo. Yeah. Because for our hapless level designer, he doesn't have the experience. He doesn't know that he can't move the tree to the left, but yeah. he has been encouraged by profit sharing to speak up. And so he's like, you know, this feels wrong, but I can't tell you why. He's got a great lead who goes, you know what? All right, you and the QA and the art department all tell me that I shouldn't move the tree to the left. You're going to move the tree to the left. I'm going to give you a reason. They're, in this example, let's just, you know, it's a players want to go to the right, but we need exploration on the left. So yeah. figure it out. Yeah. That's a pretty logical explanation. You still, our hapless level center still doesn't feel right about it. Okay. He's been encouraged to speak up. He still does it. Now the user test scores are a lot lower on that level all of a sudden. The yeah. rector's, you know, flabbergasted. He goes, what? We increased exploration. That's what our players want, et cetera. Now hapless level designer, right, has a choice. The lead goes, you, you have to figure out what's wrong. Hapless level designer was empowered to figure out what was wrong, which yeah. You know, to be fair, all of his department and QA and art were all like, your choice, director. Why are you telling me now that it's right? But, yeah. right, this is a real thing. So the director's like, you have to figure out what's wrong. What you told me to do was wrong. But he's not going to say that, right? Yeah. He's been empowered to figure it out and yeah. instead goes, you know what? This level is a running level. Players don't want to explore when they're running from their lives. Yeah. So when I put the tree to the left, they hit a dead end. Players hate it because they're dying and the zombies catch up. Yeah. I need to move that tree out and cut exploration from the level and that way they can run through it. And the lead or the director in this case will go, you know what? That makes a sound argument. Sure. Let's do it. Even though it's right. The backwards from their decision. And if they're yeah. overstressed, they probably forgot they made the decision in the first place. Also yeah. very likely. And hapless level designer with empowerment suddenly is like, ah, now I have experience about why, right. That was, bad and then it goes to user testing and then maybe the level just meets the same score it got before the tree was moved to the left so so i i would then use the example of sort of like what we do in political organizing so a, a lot of the work of political organizing is figuring out what to do with new people so like, you know, the diehards, they sort of like understand that like they're supposed to find their roles, they're supposed to get into it and they're supposed to like do things and like sort of like contact the right people, make sure that they make connections with other organizations and so forth. But then like you have people who will oftentimes show up at meetings who are like passionate, who are interested, who are like, yeah, I want to change things, but they have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. And so one of the most important roles in any like especially like when it comes to sort of like grassroots political organizing is the person who like identifies those people and sort of like moves them towards something that they can actually contribute to. So what you have to do is you first have to actually get to know that person in a meaningful way, not just in sort of like the H BSHR way where it's like, it's like, Oh, what are your interests? Like, it, no, no, you actually have to like forge a relationship with that person to understand them. And then once you understand them, actually first solicit feedback from them about what they're interested in. But oftentimes the problem that you run into is that like <clears throat> what the person claims they want to do is not actually going to be a good fit for them. And so what you need to do is you need to take their expressed interests and actually try to sort of like match them up with something that they actually will commit to in the long term. And that is where the empowerment comes in. Because the thing is like, yeah, we have our hapless level designer, like, yeah, they've been shot down 49 times. So then why is it, why would they then say anything the 50th time? They might say something the 50th time because like, let's say there's, I don't know, there's a communist revolution in like our, our sorry, what were we calling it? Um, snowstorm, snowstorm. Yes. Inc. Snowstorm, <laughs> and snowstorm, snowstorm Inc. Has, has, has a, um, has a an anarcho-syndicalist re revolution and <laughs> all the, all the social relationships are flattened. And so now like our hapless game designer is like, okay, so am I still going to do, am I still going to do level design or like, what do I do now? And then a group of people comes to this person and says, like, yes, we still need you to work on this, but how about you also now spend 20 of your time, 20% of your time working on this other thing as well? And then that person, and then our hapless level designer is, is 
doing something that they're comfortable with, but also spending a fraction of their time stepping out of their comfort zone and maybe discovering something else that they're interested in. And that is really motivating for someone, even if they're bad at it at first, because other people have come to them and said, hey, we have your back. We yep. think you might be good at this. Why don't you try it? And if it doesn't work out, you can always go back to doing what you're doing right now. Yep. And, and so, it, it's, yeah. Sorry, no, and it's that kind of like what you're phrasing right there. Isn't it just about empowerment? It's about access to opportunity within the organization. Yes. That it has something for value of them that now they get back from the organization. Because what's happening in game development right now, which is why you see a lot of turnover, layoffs, studio closures, crunch, general malaise about the industry and right all of all of the you know terrible things about games is that you don't have that access to opportunity with internal growth right you are hired to be a level designer you do level design and you do level design and you keep doing level design and you're there five years and maybe now you're senior at level design and you've just been doing level design you do level design more <laughs> you do more level design right or in some cases you just want to do more level design and end up getting promoted and now do less level design because yeah. you're leading other level designers and you would really yeah. just like to do levels and you were never actually trained to be a lead or to completely switch over to it so now you have all these people asking you for your opinion and you're like i don't have an opinion i just want to make a level right <laughs> yeah and so now right Right? In, in, our, in that scenario, right, our hapless level designer doing the levels and having the experience, right, if they weren't empowered to take on that 20% at first or had access to doing something completely different, say doing systems or even narrative, yeah. right, that hapless level designer doesn't know, right, where their career needs to go or doesn't have that opportunity for growth, right? And so I really think that like empowerment, internal growth, right, all of those are those motivation factors that actually keep people inside of um, right inside of the industry, right? We need to retain people as yeah. much as we need to, right? Then empower and spread awareness, right? For the people that haven't yet entered the industry, but could, should, need. And along to. those, and along those lines, I would add one more thing to actually buttress your point: is that the, as far as retention is concerned, the other important side effect of like giving people those opportunities and then also buttressing it with like the, the sort of the social relationships within the organization is that it also then gets that person to work with people they wouldn't otherwise normally work with. And so you create social relationships within the institution where it's like you now know just more people in your company or, or sorry, the, the anarcho-syndicalist organization known as <laughs> Snowstorm. It's Snowstorm, yes. Um, so, so you now know more people at Snowstorm. And so as a result, when problems arise, like you have a broader base of people to rely on. You don't feel isolated. You don't feel siloed anymore, precisely because you have forged a working relationship with a wider group of people. Yes. And like, and the company encourages you, right, yeah. to go out and to create those um, like societal bonds, right, so yeah. that you actually have all of those people to rely on. Yeah. I mean, for me, I have to 100% say that not being comfortable like at all, I think just regularly really helped me not realize I was uncomfortable talking to people that weren't my own discipline because I was just already uncomfortable. Yeah. So it was like normal. <laughs> um, but, but that being said, like I, I was of a position to be like, hey, I'm a game designer and level designer systems. You have to talk to engineers, artists, 3D artists, like 2D artists. Like you have to talk to animators, which are right completely different types of art. You also need to talk to programmers, but not just gameplay programmers. You talk to UI programmers, which are different than engine programmers and yep. effects programmers, and yep. right? And you work in something like that. I have to say that as a game developer, you need to have that swath, right? Whether yeah. you're a designer or an artist and you talk to an engineer or you talk, you're a 2D artist and you talk to the 3D artist, yeah. right? I think like all of that and having the ability to just, you know, get outside of that is super important. And the reason why our companies fail at that is extensively because they have that, that siloing, that yeah. stay in your lane mentality. Yep. And the more companies try to hire those types of specialists and try to cross train and try to, or try to not cross train, just want specialists and just want people that are good in their field in that one aspect. Like they're only going to get people that don't know how to work with others because yeah. those people have been siloed and they never have known. Yeah. It's weird. It's, so. it's like people have almost bought into like the, the ocean's 11 ideology. They assume that like 
well, each task has to have this like specific person. I who like does just that watched Ocean's Eleven actually, like so. This is really relevant to yeah. me. Like... So, but 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 there, <laughs> but there is this belief that is common amongst yes. people that likes like okay, we can break down the total job into this discrete set of tasks, and then all we need is the one person who is good at that task, and they do only that. Yes, but, no, that is absolutely the problem with game design. Like you the, are already reali- yeah, but now work in like, games. You can work in games. Come to our levels. Done. Yeah. You a hundred percent like with that sentence but the sorry problem please is like rephrase all, it because it's all collective labor does not work that way yes like the no most... collective labor works with just a set series of tasks and itemizing everything out and yeah, just assigning them to special it's such be, it's it's such bs because like again if you look at every any other creative industry like the most important people say like on a movie set are the ones who actually like communicate between various like aspects of the shoot Yep. And the only and when production breaks down is usually precisely because people are not communicating with each other. So this idea that somehow like you can produce this like total like almost like like monumental work of art by like okay I'll just do my my little piece of it and then make sure that it like attaches almost as if it were like Lego to the other pieces like it just doesn't work that way. No, absolutely. And it's not it's not modular design. Like modular doesn't mean everybody's an individual Lego brick and we all just put together and suddenly we have like the Millennium Falcon hanging from our ceiling. Like that's not how it works. No. (laughs) Right? If you just looked at each individual Lego brick, you're completely missing the big picture. That is, you're building the Millennium Falcon. You take that set and you don't give instructions or you don't look at the picture, you're not gonna build it. You're just gonna build a bunch of towers and square bricks everywhere because that's how how Legos work. Well, you you see, yeah, the thing is you you might produce like and again, the sort of like this analogy to sort of like say the individual teams that work on particular like aspects like you know say like 2d art 3d art um animators like ue designers like they might achieve something really interesting like within the context of that particular silo and that's still they still did it collectively but then the problem arises again it's it's like what i was talking about earlier with sort of like the the aesthetic to the ethical to you know the the religious stage is that you reach a hard wall where like you can achieve something within sort of like the sphere that you're working in, but then it doesn't translate to those others. And if you're not thinking about how it translates to those others, if you're not encouraged to think about how it translates to those others, it won't. Exactly. You need the cosmologist that goes, you need to think about how it translates to the others. You need to think about bringing it up. But I would argue that you don't just see, but I think that's the way things currently work. I think you do like when it works under sort of like the current like capitalist system, you do have someone, you do have a God who sort of like directs things and sort of like makes sure that they're sort of like everything is eventually coming together. But I think there's another way to do it. Another way to do it is by if, if, if again we're thinking about sort of like a bottom up rather than a top down model is by actually instilling in each of those individuals like an ethic of, yes. of sort of like going beyond their individual silo and, and actually communicating themselves well and that's why i brought up like that you need I, I said you, but I mean, like, I think the industry right now needs certain people that can instill that type of value, right? And this goes back to that people's companies, right? That it can instill that ethics, can instill that empowerment, and that inspiration to make people think beyond what they're used to normally thinking, but also to people who have never enter the industry they don't know that that's not how it is so don't tell them that's how it is and just be like hey everybody (laughs) always thinks this way it's always been bottom up just 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 live it right that's the next the next next gen i think will just live that versus the next gen is right fighting against that ceiling of top-down approach and And you need that person is because right now i do think that the reason why we're in our problems is because we have that one say god that's like oh no here's how everything needs to work and in some cases if you have a good god well then yes it works (laughs) but there are a lot more bad gods in say history (laughs) than there are good gods right (laughs) and so you'll have things where it's like oh well we all just got by right there's there's so many more dev horror stories right than there are the dev no everything was perfect for this development process like i I've, I've never heard that story, yeah. right? And so I think that it is about right instilling that within people so that they can, I don't want to say rise to the challenge because because it is a challenge, but I just mean, you know, they can instill it, that belief, right? That, yeah, because no, belief is, pers- I mean, I know we've been talking like weird, airy, fairy, like theological terms, but in many ways, it's the appropriate way to think of it because we're talking about changing a worldview, changing the yes. way you think about how you do things and the value and what the value is of what you do. Yep. 
And that is not some sort of like, hey, let's go into retreat and we'll figure it out. No, that is like you have to fundamentally shift your worldview. Yes, you have to shift your worldview. Scary to do. It is. No, and I think that that's why I am so excited for these next, like, say, eight years of video game development in that I'm seeing these, these, you know, these companies that are like, we don't take BS, we have values. Like, that's their front page. They just, they don't even say what the values are. They're just like, we have value. The fact that we have values is already Mm. like crazy in this weird game industry world. And they just acknowledge that. And that's hilarious and also true and kind of sad, but, but hilarious. Well, because you, because you want to believe in those things. Because you want to believe in those things. Right. And I think that, and then people inherently at the end of the day, though, already believe in those things, like, like integrity, like the value of family, the value of creativity, making an impact, being authentic right? Like all of those are values that people already value. Being free, freedom, right? That's a great, huge value right there. You believe in free will, free choice, right? Doing whatever you want with whatever you want. But no, wait, wait, did we just circle back around to Randy and objectivism? (laughs) (laughs) No, I I brought that up just for just for the lulz. Um, (laughs) uh, So but, you know, all of that diatribe aside, it, it really is exciting right now because yes it is we are seeing a public company having to say we have to crunch we are seeing a game get delayed over and over again which to be honest i would rather see them getting delayed Mm. just because i know the quality of the game will be better and at the end of the day as a game developer myself you always want more time with your product right exactly and i think that it will make a better experience but to look at the human cost of crunch and to look at the human cost of how it needs to be better I mean, we just have to look at that belief, right? Yeah. And if we are cynical and we go into the, well, we don't really bring, we're just making games, right? If we, if we then already start that way, we won't have value in our organizations and we won't be able to spearhead it. Thank you for listening, everyone. That's our episode for this week. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps us out. Um, you can follow me at U-A-H-S-E-N-A-A on Twitter.com on the Hell website itself. And you can also follow Lauren at uh, the Lauren Ash, also Twitter.com, and I think she's on Instagram as well. Um, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Footy Dash Podcast. Until then, bye bye.